Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 91. Today's show marks the beginning of a whole new series on the animals. In the last series, we explored the many strange and exotic protostome animals, and now we'll be looking at the other half of the animal kingdom, at the deuterostomes. This superphylum includes some of the largest and most complex animals on the planet, so our exploration of the deuterostome lineage will definitely be a fascinating and thought-provoking journey. If we go back in time, before either the protostomes or the deuterostomes existed, the only animals that swam in the Earth's primordial oceans were the simple, radially symmetrical Nadarian animals of the Ediacaran period, and, of course, even simpler, smaller things that emerged before them. These Nadarian animals, at the time, represented the evolutionary pinnacle. They were the most complex things swimming around. These were things like sponges and corals, and the free-floating jellyfish and hydra. These rudimentary and primitive animals had a single orifice, a combined mouth-anus, where both food was ingested and waste expelled. This is perhaps most obvious when you look at the anatomy of a jellyfish, with its rounded top, and on the bottom, its mouth-anus surrounded by stinging tentacles. Within this early group of primitive animals, some lineages would evolve major changes in their embryonic development. Specifically, they evolved to have two orifices instead of one. They evolved a distinct mouth and anus, and this created a linear gut or digestive tract. However, the exact process by which this happened is still a matter of debate. There are several competing ideas about how these radially symmetrical Nadarian-like ancestors gave rise to the first bilaterally symmetrical protostomes and deuterostomes. One idea that seems to be particularly popular is called the interoceal theory. To paraphrase this argument, the idea is that a radially symmetric animal with a single orifice evolved, perhaps during some mishap during embryological development, to have the middle section of that orifice fused together. Imagine you're holding a rubber O-ring, or some kind of plastic ring like that, like a part to a car or you know, some machine or something. Now, if you pinch on opposite sides of that O-ring, that, that rubber band, you pinch them together until your fingers close, but you've just created two smaller, somewhat teardrop-shaped holes on either side of your fingers. This is the same general idea here. You had this one major orifice used for both eating and excreting waste, and during embryological development, it didn't separate fully. And instead, you had these two orifices. And apparently, this was still able to offer some functionality to the organism. It wasn't lethal or terminal in an evolutionary sense. But instead, this adaptation induced a directionality in the organism. Instead of being radially symmetrical with a single centrally positioned digestive orifice, now with two orifices, we begin to see the introduction of linearity in the body form and bilateral symmetry. Initially, after this evolutionary development, both digestive orifices could serve the same function as the original orifice. They could both intake food and excrete waste. But over time, they evolved to become specialized. One orifice for food intake, and the other for the excretion of waste. As the protostomes and deuterostomes diverged, one of the deepest and most basal differences was in the pattern of embryological construction regarding these two digestive orifices. The protostomes evolved their mouths first and their anus second, and the deuterostomes went in the opposite direction. They evolved their anus first and their mouths second. Another idea in this space of competing hypotheses about the origination of the protostomes and deuterostomes is that these lineages evolved independently and in the process, each of them also evolved bilateral symmetry. Right away, there's a statistical argument against this, because bilateral symmetry seems like it might be a rather challenging thing to evolve. And if we look in the fossil record, we really only see it happening the one time, and everything after that persisted with the bilateral symmetry. Of course, you have exceptions, like starfish and whatnot. 
But there is an argument to be made that if you had an independent genesis of bilateral symmetry in each of these lineages, well, that would explain some of these really deep basal developmental differences, like the, the order of which orifice forms first. In the protostomes, the mouth orifice formed, and then it pinched off to create a distinct anus. In the deuterostomes, the anus formed, and the gut stretched and expanded until it connected to the body wall and erupted through it to form a mouth. Now, there's also another idea that the protostomes evolved first, generally in the way I just described, but then you had a lineage of protostomes that diverged to create the ancestral deuterostomes. This would explain the apparent homology of the protostome and deuterostome nerve cords. Now, these are all competing hypotheses. There's strengths and weaknesses to each one, but as of now, as of the time that I'm recording this, this is not an issue that's been resolved. There's no conclusive, solid evidence bringing us to a, a clear, definitive answer here. In any case, if we're going to get on to this, this story of the taxonomy and phylogeny of the deuterostomes, well, the whole grand narrative begins sometime 560 to 540 million years ago, when the first suspected ancestors of the deuterostomes appeared. The first animal that we have good reason to think is the oldest deuterostome, and thus the ancestor of all modern deuterostomes, or at least perhaps part of the stem group related to the ancestor of them all, is the Saccharitis coronarius, which was a small, globular creature that lived about 540 million years ago in the very beginning of the Cambrian period. The S. coronarius was barely larger than a millimeter in size. Its small, round body had a disproportionately large mouth and a set of small, cone-like bumps protruding from its sides. It swam around in the primordial oceans, gobbling up food particles and excreting waste presumably through the same orifice, which suggests that these fossils represent a very basal ancestor in the deuterostome lineage, which existed before the distinct mouth and anus were even evolved. The cone-like bumps on S. coronarius' sides may have been proto-appendages, or if S. coronarius lived a mixed or majority sessile life, they may have been some kind of suction or anchoring device. From these humble beginnings, the deuterostome lineage would blossom, establishing an incredible and radical degree of biodiversity. Deuterostomes would come to dominate the planet, filling the oceans, the land, and the air with a breathtaking variety of species. Some of the most basal of these deuterostome clades include the blastozoa and the edrioasteroids, which are all small, radially symmetrical animals that used some kind of appendage or feature to attach themselves to the substrate. The cone-like bumps of S. coronarius presumably evolved into the long arms that are so characteristic of the modern echinoderms. Curiously, there's also a strong argument to make that the earliest deuterostomes, or at least the immediate ancestors to the echinoderms, were in fact bilaterally symmetrical, and that radial symmetry was re-evolved later on in these echinoderm lineages, like the starfish. The basis for this argument is that if you look at the larval stage of many of these echinoderms, from sea lilies to starfish, the larval stage is bilaterally symmetrical. They only develop the radial symmetry that they're known for after a major body-transforming metamorphosis event. All right, now I know we're a bit deep into the episode for this, but today's show is about these first deuterostomes, these echinoderms. The name echinoderm comes from the texture of their skin which typically seems spiny, like a hedgehog. The two most universal features of these echinoderms are their radial symmetry and their habitat. With the exception of the sea cucumbers, the echinoderms have a five-point radial symmetry. This is quite clear with the starfish, for example, but it gets a bit more complex or subtle when you're talking about stuff like the sea lilies, which have five arms that each branch into pairs, giving them not five, but ultimately ten appendages. With respect to their habitat, all echinoderms live in marine ecosystems. There are no freshwater or terrestrial echinoderms. At best, you'll have some starfish and sea cucumbers 
that live in the intertidal zones along the coast. All right, so reorienting back to the evolutionary history of the deuterostomes, the mainstream understanding is that the blastozoa gave rise to the most primitive echinoderms, although a popular competing hypothesis is that this role was in fact filled by the edrioasteroids. But whichever it was, whichever of them came first or began to diversify first, they gave rise to the Crinozoa subphylum, and within that, the class Crinoidea, which includes species known as the feather stars and the sea lilies. These are passive suspension feeders that extract algae out of the water using their five long arms. These arms bring food down to the oral plate, which is basically the upper surface of their body, containing both their mouth and, nearby, their anus. As members of an ancient clade that have experienced multiple mass extinction events, most of the crinoidea have gone extinct. Of the four known subclasses, three of them are lost to time. All of the remaining crinoidea exist in the Articulata subclass, which contains less than a hundred species spread across just six extant orders. Alphabetically, these are the Borgetocrinida, the Comatulida, the Cerdocrinida, the Hyocrinida, the Isocrinida, and the Milleracrinida. All right, so let's start out with the Borgetocrinida, also known rather generically as the sea lilies. There's about 80 extant species in this order, which are the descendants of a single genus that survived the Permian-Triassic extinction event. That single genus represented the lone survivors out of a larger clade of some 6,000 species that existed previously. The Permian really was a fertile time for the sea lilies, but since the Great Dying, that mass extinction event that ended the Permian and the Paleozoic, the Brigetta were the only sea lilies that lingered on. The sea lilies are characterized by a small central body mass surrounded by five pairs of long feather-like arms, which rake the seawater grasping for food particles to drag down to the mouth. A long flexible stalk connects the body to the substrate, like a strange kind of aquatic animal version of a root system with tissues that grow out to anchor in mud or sand, or to grip onto rocks or hardened corals along the sea floor. Closely related to the Brigetta are the Comatulida, or the feather stars. During their larval development, Comatulida have a stalk, but this breaks down during metamorphosis to create a free-living adult. They can use their arms to swim through the water and anchor their bodies directly to the substrate with a ring of little claws on their underside. Among the Comatulida order, there are various clades like the Aporometra genus, with its three species living in the waters around Australia, the Nodocrinus genus, with its two species found in the icy ocean waters around Antarctica, where they're, they're victims to parasitic sea snails, and the Bathocrinus genus, which has representative species in both the South Pacific and the North Atlantic. The other crinoidea clades are relatively small and obscure. The isocrinida, cerdocrinida, and the hyocrinida are enigmatic groups of delicate, stalk-bearing sea lilies, with four families, three families, and one family, respectively. The isocrinida, in particular, contain some of the more classic, recognizable, and charismatic examples of sea lilies, including the Poisocrinus ruberimus, with its feathery red arms and pink stalk. The shallow water-dwelling Japanese sea lily, Metacrinus rotundus, and the great West Indian sea lily, Cenocrinus asters. And of course, the last crinoidea order, Milleracrinida, is particularly enigmatic, even among its rather mysterious peers. In fact, it's so enigmatic, so mysterious, that I really couldn't find much information on it at all, besides the fact that it has at least one family, the Phrynocrinidae of uh, ruddy orange or red sea lilies. Now the next major echinoderm class are the Asteroidea, also known as the starfish. These are perhaps some of the most identifiable and charismatic of all echinoderms. Their five limbs sprawl across the ground, 
sheltering beneath them a legion of tubes that operate as feet, each making small steps to carry the whole organism along the seafloor. There is a tremendous variety of starfish, including some 1,500 living species, spread across seven orders, although the composition and the placement of these orders is sometimes in a state of flux. And this is largely because the older classifications based on morphology are being superseded by more accurate classifications based on genetic analysis, although the Asteroidea, much like their crustacean second cousins, have stubbornly remained a challenging enigma, despite the best efforts of geneticists and molecular scientists. This is kind of the case for the echinoderms as a whole, but I'll get into that in a few minutes. Anyways, because there's no settled evolutionary order for the clades within the Asteroidea, I'll just go through them according to their biodiversity, starting with the smallest order and moving towards the largest. We'll start with the Nodomyotida, which is an order including no less than 75 species of deep-sea-dwelling starfish. These pale creatures are characterized by long, flexible limbs that twist and fold in a manner not altogether dissimilar to an octopus's tentacles. Their arms are lined with small, spiny protrusions, not dissimilar to the hairs on the feathers of a sea lily. This anatomical trait is also shared by the Brasingida, the next largest clade with some 111 species. These are also deep-sea starfish, characterized by their large numbers of limbs. Instead of just five arms, they have anywhere from 6 arms to 18 or even 20. Some examples include the Brasinga and the Cacnemos, which is a small, brilliantly red-colored starfish with 9 to 12 arms, which can be found in the deep waters off the coast of Norway. In the geographical vicinity, you also have the Friella elegans, which has 12 arms and is uh, suspected of being a filter feeder instead of an active predator like many of the other echinoderms. And then there's the giant, bright red, 18-armed monsters of the Novodinia genus. This is followed by the relatively modern Spinulocyta order, with around 130 species, give or take. These are typically pink, red, or orange-colored starfish with small, central bodies, and typically five thick, cylindrical arms. They prefer warmer waters, and can be found in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, but they live mainly in the waters around the tropical coastlines of the Atlantic Ocean. Some notable examples in the Spinulocyta order include the Pacific blood star Henrici leviuscula and the mosaic sea star Plectaster decanus, which is poisonous, and if you pick it up and hold it for a moment, it'll make your hands go numb. Another order of starfish are the Velatida which are broad, thick, fat starfish with stubby but flexible arms. They live in the deep areas across the world's oceans, preferring cold water habitats near the poles. These include the spiny, striking sea star Eurotaster insignis, which is one of the very, very, very few velatida that live in shallow tropical waters. There's also the wrinkled star Terraster militaris and the pale white slime star Terraster tessellatus. The third largest order is the Forcipulatida, with approximately 270 temperate water, cold water, and deep water species. Many of these starfish are some of the most common and well known, including the sugar star Asturias rubens, as well as more exotic species like the tropical sun star Heliaster helianthus, the cold water starfish Libidiaster annulatus, which is characterized by a large number of long, thin, flexible arms and the small, stout, spiny, and surprisingly aggressive six-rayed starfish, Leptasterius hexactus. The second largest order of starfish is the Paxilocyda, with some 370 species. These starfish are pretty unique in the sense that they don't actually have an anus, and they simply expel waste through their mouths, and for many of them, their arms are curiously devoid of tube feet. They tend to live in sandy sediment along the seafloor or near the coast, where they extract food items from the sand. The Paxilocyta includes all manner of strange starfish, 
such as the red comb star Astropectin orensiacus, the nine-armed sea star Luidia senegalensis, and the highly voracious royal starfish Astropectin articulatus, known for the deep purple coloration on its body and back, and bright orange margins along the edges of its arms. The largest order of starfish is the Valvatida, with almost 700 species. As the largest order, it contains a broad diversity of starfish, from the lanky blue-colored Linkia livigata to the rugged red-knobbed starfish Protoreister linkii, from the adorable-looking club-armed doughboy starfish Coriaster granulatus and the puffy pentagonal cushion stars Colcida nova egwini to the wicked-looking, extremely spiky Crown of Thorns starfish Acanthaster plansi, from the relatively small starfish of the Astropsiidae family, to the enormous, sausage-armed Thromidia catali, which is likely the largest starfish of them all. The raw morphological diversity among all of these starfish is truly breathtaking and astounding and beautiful. Now the next echinoderm class are the Ophiuroidea, or the brittle sea stars, which includes well over 2,000 species. They're closely related to the starfish, genetically and morphologically. Now, you remember when I mentioned that starfish taxonomy was in flux? Well, this is also true for the Ophiuroidea, and it's kind of true for the echinoderms as a whole, just to a lesser degree. What I mean by this is that within Echinodermata, the crinoidea, or the sea lilies, are generally considered the most basal lineage, and after them emerged the asteroidea, the starfish. The most recently emerged lineages are the echinoidea, or the sea urchins, and the holothuroidea, or the sea cucumbers, which together form a clade called the echinozoa. Sister to the echinozoa are the asterozoa, which contains the starfish of asteroidea. In the middle of these two groups, Echinozoa and Asterozoa, are the Ophiuroidea, although their exact relationship to these other groups is still a matter of debate. According to the Asterozoan hypothesis, the brittle stars are a member of the Asterozoa alongside the starfish. And this makes sense morphologically, as the Ophiuroidea and the starfish are extremely similar in appearance. But on the other hand, there's the Cryptosyringid hypothesis which places the brittle stars in the Cryptosyringida clade alongside sea urchins and sea cucumbers. In any case, the brittle stars are five-armed creatures with a very distinct puck or disc-like center core that uh, it's very obvious compared to the starfish, whose body center is seamlessly fused with their arms. The Ophiuroidea arms are long and highly flexible, like tentacles that they use to crawl across the seafloor. The Ophiuroidea taxonomy is a bit messy and uneven, with some families having hundreds of species and others having very few. Some of the most notable clades include the Uralida order of basket stars, which are named after their weaved basket-like appearance. They have this weaved basket-like look because their arms, as they extend out away from the center core of the body, begin to branch multiple times, and this creates a dense canopy of tentacles, like a, like a giant brush almost, and this effectively filters food particles out of the water. These Uralida include the Estrobanuda with its ghostly, pale, neatly arranged feather-like arms, the nocturnal giant basket star Astrophyton muricatum with its long arms covered in sharply branching protrusions, and altogether this forms a spiny, messy tangle and the family Gorgonocephalidae, which includes some of the largest Ophiuroid species. Another Ophiuroidea clade is the Aphiuridae, a family of long-armed, burrowing, brittle stars, which are typically small, humble creatures that bury their bodies in the sand and raise their arms up into the water, simultaneously reaching out to catch prey and hiding from predators. This diverse Aphiuridae family include the noodle-armed Aphioidea pulchella, the heavily spine-covered Amphioplus thromboses, and the pale, brooding snake star Amphiopholus squamata. 
arguably the largest Ophiuridae clade by far, is the Ophiurida. Among the ranks of the Ophiurida, you can find things like the Ophiotrichidae family, known for their translucent, thorny spines that cover their arms. This family includes the common brittle star Ophiothrix fragilis and the angular brittle star Ophiothrix angulata. Beyond this, there's also the small, black-bodied Ophiocoma scolopendrina, the black serpent star Ophiocomena nigra, which is honestly more of a ruddy brown color than a black, and the mini-species of the Ophiurina superorder, including the milky-white, heavily-scaled Ophiohamus nanus, the tiny silver-blue little brittle star Ophiactus savignii, and the frighteningly spiny arms of the Ophiactus simplex. Alright, that's it for the various types of starfish and sea stars. Next up, we have some more unique classes, like the Echinoidea, also known as the sea urchins. If you remember from just a few minutes ago, the sea urchins are closely related to the Ophiuridae as per the cryptosyringid hypothesis. The sea urchins and the sea cucumbers are themselves within a subphylum known as the Echinozoa, and unlike the various types of star-shaped echinoderms, the Echinozoa have no arms or other such appendages at all. The sea urchins are spherical or globular in shape, and the sea cucumbers are essentially giant slug-like tubes. The sea urchins belong to the class Echinoidea, and despite their globular form, they still possess a kind of five-point symmetry like their starfish cousins. Except, instead of arms, the five-point symmetry in the Echinoidea is expressed in, in several ways. Uh, you have the five to ten basic sections, bulges, or plate columns in the shell itself. There's a, a five-point symmetry in the presentation of the five calcium carbonate tooth plates on the bottom of the animal's body and the, the seafloor facing surface. And there's also five-point symmetry in the five genital plates and gonophores that surround the anus on the upper surface. The sea urchin shell is particularly cool. It's heavily ridged and grooved, creating channels that organize and run between numerous sockets. Protruding from these sockets are very long, needle-like spines, which are used as a kind of passive self-defense. This protects the sea urchin as it crawls along the seafloor with its cluster of tube feet, using its hard teeth to scrape algae, or small creatures, off the rocks. Within the sea urchin family tree, there's more than ten orders, although the exact number of orders generally changes as groups are consolidated or moved around based on new genetic studies. The most ancient of these orders is the Sideroida order, of the Parashoshinoidea subclass. These Sideroidan sea urchins are called pencil urchins, due to their characteristically long, sometimes thick, widely spaced, pencil-like spines, which are most evident on species like Sidaris sidaris and Philocanthus imperialis. Also among the ranks of the most basal orders are the Echinotherioidea and the Diadematoida, which are known for having long, hollow spines. Identifiable members of the Diadematoida include the Diadema setosum, with its impressively long, sharp black spines, and the palish pink sea urchins of the Aspidodiadematidae family that live in the abyssal depths of the deep sea. The Echinotherioidea have a slightly more exotic appearance, with bright colors and stranger shapes, like, for example, the fire urchin Asthenosoma barium the alien-looking toxic leather sea urchin, Asthenosoma maris rubri, and the small, dark, reddish Formosoma placentae. All of these are also known to dwell on the deep-sea ocean floor. But in contrast, you have members of the Spatangoida order, the heart urchins, which have small, short spines that look almost like hairs than actual defensive spikes, particularly in the Lovaneidae and the Spatangidae families. These are also some of the only bilaterally symmetrical sea urchins, as their anus and mouth are not centered on the top and bottom surfaces, but are instead positioned near the back and near the front, respectively. Curiously, the Spitangoida order is associated with the Cassiduloida and the Holectopoida, two orders of sea urchins that are similar to the heart urchins morphologically, 
but genetically are much more closely related to the sand dollars of the Clipasteroida order. Both the Cassiduloida and the Holectopoida are ancient clades that have been largely destroyed by mass extinction since the Mesozoic. Today, there's only two genera of Holectopoida and only seven species of Cassiduloida. The Clipasteroida order itself, also known as the sand dollars, pansy shells, sea cookies, and sea biscuits, includes some 11 species of disc-like sea urchin with an aesthetically pleasing variety of five-point patterns on their shell. And just like their Spatangoida cousins, these also have very small, very fine spines, if they have any spines at all. The next derived group of sea urchins belongs to the Petanoida order, known for their tessellated shell plates. Their smaller spines are hollow, like the more basal cousins, but their longer spines are solid, which is a trait seen in their more derived cousins, making them a kind of interesting evolutionary intermediate. Skipping along the sea urchin family tree, we pass by several orders, including the Selenioida order, known for having a large distinctive plate on the top of the shell, the Arbacioida order, including species like the bright red, orange, and white Coeloplurus floridanus, the white and purple, puck-like Coeloplurus exquisitus, and the freakish, black spikeball Arbacia luxula. Within the order Temnopleroida, there's a genus called Toxopneustus, which possesses a venom in their spines. Perhaps the most well-known of these is the Toxopneustus pileolus, the flower urchin which uses chemicals like nerve agent contractin A and petatoxin in its venom. These chemicals cause extremely painful stings that can induce muscle contraction, spasms, shock, and in some organisms, death. The most recently derived sea urchin order is the Echinoida, which includes many common and well-known sea urchins like the edible common sea urchin Echinus esculentus. The Caribbean rock borer urchin, Echinometra lacunter, with its dense cluster of sharp, thick needles. The Pacific red sea urchin, Strongylocentrotus franciscans, with its bright red and orange spines. The large, bowl-like New Zealand sea urchin, Evachinus chloroticus. And the shingle urchin, Colobocentrotus atratus, which looks like a black turtle shell surrounded by a mane of small tongues of black tissue. This Colobocentrotus atratus is particularly common in Hawaii, where it's known as the Kau Pali, and can be found clinging to almost every coastal rock in the intertidal zone. All right, now we've come to the final echinoderm class, the Holotheroidea, also known as the sea cucumbers. Compared to all of the other echinoderms, these are perhaps the least similar, because Unlike the sea lilies, they have no filtering arms, they have no stalks holding them to the ground. Unlike the starfish and the brittle stars, they aren't star-shaped, as they don't have arms. And unlike the sea urchins, with whom they are the most closely related, they have no spines, and no fused or external shell plates. Also, unlike most other echinoderms, they are bilaterally symmetrical, and not radially symmetrical. The sea cucumbers do possess a set of small but often complex and identifiable tentacles around their mouth to help with feeding, and many species have small, soft, cone-like pseudospines along their sides and back. They do have tube feet on the bottom of their body, which they use to scurry along the seafloor and scavenge for food. Within the Holotheroidea, there are at least six orders of sea cucumber with a generally confirmed taxonomic placement. In order of most basal to most recently derived groups, these are the Apodida, the Elazopodida, the Holotheriida, the Mulpatida, the Dendrochirodida, the Dactylochirodida, and the Persiculida. All right, so like usual, let's start with the most basal. The Apodida includes some 270 species of long, snake, or worm-like sea cucumber that lack tube feet, including the striped Cynoptula limperdi whose body is covered in very tiny hooks that make it feel kind of sticky, like a, like a weird, superfine biological Velcro. And this also helps with locomotion. Other interesting species in this group include the Caribbean beaded sea cucumber, Euaptolapa, and the sickly pink, Chiridota hahiva. 
The Elazapodida are unusual among the sea cucumbers in that they actually do have appendages, including broad, fin-like tentacles that make them look like some kind of weird, heavily mutated octopus or jellyfish. Arguably, the most recognizable is the Inapniasti eximia, which is also known as the pink see-through fantasia, the Spanish dancer, or, more illustratively, the headless chicken monster. The Holothuriida also have flattened, fin, or leaf-like tentacles, but these are much smaller than those seen in the Elazapodida. They include some of the most recognizable sea cucumbers, like the Actinopyga echinides and the Bohadgia argus, as well as more exotic specimens, like the velvety, eel-like Holothurian edulis, and the pale, spiky, eerily white Lepidodemus rugosum. Then we have the Mulpidida order, characterized by slow-moving, spindle-shaped sea cucumbers. And then there's the, the very diverse Dendrochirodida order, which includes suspension-feeding sea cucumbers that have either long, worm-like or stout, sausage-like shapes, and even some species that have a radial shape with heavily branching protrusions, like the Neothionidium magnum, and those sea cucumbers that are spherical or even shaped like a hand grenade, like the Pseudocolochirus violaceus. And then we come to the Dectylocoratida order, which is particularly unique, as its member species have mouths that are surrounded by unbranching tentacles, and their bodies are not soft, but are in fact surrounded by a tough but flexible shell, kind of like a sea urchin. Now these are all of the sea cucumber orders with a generally confirmed phylogenetic placement. There's technically several other sea cucumber clades, often called orders, that I could go over, but these groups do not have a confirmed placement in relation to the other orders, and several of them, such as the Persiculida and the Synalactida, have been found to be paraphyletic, and they've had their member species reorganized and redistributed into other groups. Thus, it would be kind of tricky for me to give any kind of cohesive, meaningful description of them. In any case, this concludes our exploration of the class Echinodermata. This also concludes our introductory episode to this playlist on the deuterostomes, the second major division of the animal kingdom alongside the protostomes that we explored in the previous series. Now, just as the protostome series included four episodes in the mini-series on the arthropods, the next five episodes in this series on the deuterostomes will be a mini-series of its own on the vertebrates. So the next episode, episode 92, we'll look at the most basal of these vertebrates, the fish. And then after that, the rest of this mini-series will climb up the vertebrate evolutionary tree to take a look at the taxonomy and phylogenetic relationships of the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, and finally, the mammals. This is going to be a really cool series, as many of these larger deuterostome animals are so much more familiar to us. It should be a really fun ride through evolutionary history. So hit that subscribe button if you want to listen to those episodes right when they're posted. If you liked this episode, hit the like button or give it a five-star review. And if you want to support the show monetarily, check out the official store or consider becoming a supporter on Patreon. And as always, thanks for listening. Oh.